Welcome to Rebuilders. My name is Liddy. I am here with Mark Sayers. How are you going today, Mark? I'm going well. Yourself? Very well. I have my pastry here in front of me. We as have do you. Double, <laughs> double delivery today. Um, both yeah. Daniel and Liddy decided to go on pastry duty, but I'm not complaining because I've got, I've got two, two you're, croissants. You're on next time, Mark. Yeah, yeah, I will. We are very privileged today to be joined by John Tyson. How are you going over there in New York City, John? You know, I'm doing really well. Thanks so much, Ralph, for having me on the podcast. Obviously, you've got a ton of love and respect for what you guys are up to, so it's a joy to be able to chat for a bit. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, For those of you who do not know John Tyson, he has been the uh, lead pastor or senior pastor of uh, Church of the City, New York, for four years, and he's lived in New York for 16 years, but... He is actually from Australia, if you can't already tell by the accent. He is from South Australia, um, just like our intrepid sound man, Daniel. So, yeah, it's heaps good. Yeah, he, heaps yeah, good. Right, heaps good. <laughs> He's in good company. So, it's such a pleasure to have you here, John. Um, we're just going to dive right in. Obviously, it's been a particularly challenging year um, for yep. leaders across the world. What has it been like for you? Let's start, well, let's start there. <laughs> Okay, just, just before I do jump in, I just do want to say um, how much respect I have uh, for you guys as leaders, uh, Mark, particularly your leadership. Very, very grateful for that. And it has provided me some clarity and direction in a lot of the challenges. Mm. And uh, I know there's a lot of young folks and other leaders who are looking up to you. So I just want to acknowledge the role you play in the body of Christ, mate. Thank you. It's helped oh. me immensely. And uh, I'm grateful for that. So Thank you. what's the last year been like? Oh, honestly, it's uh, been a crucible. It's been a crucible of profound formation. Mm. A lot of stuff has come to the surface. Uh, a lot of things have deepened. A lot of things have fallen away. Uh, I, I had something very, very interesting happen right at the start of COVID. Uh, my wife got COVID very, very badly in bed for a month, um, bilateral pneumonia, big concerns about blood clots. I mean, it was just a total disaster. And I'm crying out to God. And in the midst of that, I feel God speak to me very clearly and say, don't forget to enjoy me. Hmm. I want you to enjoy me. And I was like, what what sort of word is that (laughs) for a moment like this? But I tried to obey it, not to question it. And so I try to just spend the early hours of the day um, being grateful for the resolution I had about life. Hmm. I'm chosen by God. My sins are forgiven. I'm adopted into his family. I have eternal life. I'm going to rule and reign as a king and priest in the new heavens and the new earth. I'm going to see him face to face. This is only a blip in eternity, and I can sit here with total security about the outcome of my life. And I try to root myself in that. So Mm -hmm. I honestly felt like I had the most chaotic, heartbreaking, painful, confusing external year and a year of profound internal joy and happiness in God. Doesn't mean that there wasn't like tremendous moments, but I felt like I just had this internal reservoir that I was drawing from. So yeah, there was an inner world that I lived out of. Uh, 2020 was one of the best years for my heart yeah. and one of the hardest years for my life. So that sort of complexity, you know. I mean, you know, sounds pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I guess, well, that personal life super intense. Um, Looking more at the church context, you as a leader, not only in um, Church of the City, but I guess as a a Christian leader um, across the world, uh, what have been the leadership lessons that you have discovered in this time? So I spent a little bit bit of time trying to sort of process that. So I'm just going to riff for a minute if I can. I've got it in two categories. It's about courage and it's about compassion. So Mm. um, obviously you're obviously very familiar with uh, Friedman's work on failure of nerve. Mm. It's not just failure of nerve, it's failure of heart. Those to me are the two great temptations of leaders. So I had to learn to lead with courage. So I felt like there was three specific things that required courage for my leadership. Number one, the challenge that Elijah faced, which was like, leading against dominant personalities. Mm. You know, Elijah, you think, would just be fine. He had so much momentum, saw the literal fire of God from heaven fall, validate Yahweh is the one true God. Jezebel says, 
right, that's it. And he just runs off and he literally says, Lord, I've had enough. Takes a nap. God has to tap him with an angel, feed him and take another nap. I mean, total discouragement. So having courage against dominant personalities, I definitely rest with dominant personalities in my community and city coming against me. Secondly, uh, the courage in shifting momentum dynamics. Um, before COVID, we were like, I honestly felt like we were just about touching spiritual awakening. I mean, we'd never, we'd been building for this for years. Mm. We were seeing manifestations of the presence of God and response in our gatherings like I'd read about. It was honestly extraordinary. And in a week it disappeared. Mm. And I, I felt like Peter, who had all the momentum of the Messiah, he was unstoppable. Mm. And then a teenage girl, when the momentum dynamic shift, says, aren't you one of him? And he denies Jesus. Yeah. And that, that like the pressure to lead when the momentum is against you, not for you. I definitely felt that. And then um, courage with the anxiety of people about the future. Mm. Uh, I'm thinking of Aaron and the golden calf incident when Moses goes up to basically ratify the covenant and receive future directions from God. He's gone for a bit and everyone says, like, make us some gods. We don't know what's happened to the other bloke. And um, and then Aaron has a complete failure of nerve and just gives in to the whims of the people. Mm. So those things, you know, personalities, momentum, dynamics, anxiety about the future, I've had to learn to have courage in those. And then yeah. not wanting to have a failure of nerve and then, when it comes to compassion, I didn't want to have a failure of heart. Mm. It's possible to sort of ha have like an aggression or even a faithfulness in your leadership but not love the people that you're leading, yeah. no tenderness. And Moses, you know, he got a little bitter. He starts out as an intercessor, but then he starts complaining to the people. God was angry with me because of you. Mm. And he only saw his destiny from a distance. He didn't get to enter in. And God actually says to Moses, don't talk to me about this anymore. His heart got bitter towards the people he was called to lead. Mm. And uh, so I had to learn to just say, Lord, even though people have been very, very critical, the loudest criticism I've ever gotten, I've still got to love these people. So tending to my heart, asking Jesus for his mercy. And then people, I lost people, man. I was just surprised at how quickly people that I had discipled and poured into and cared for just abandoned, based, like deconstructed faith in the crisis. Yeah. Mm. And I felt like Paul, where he's like everyone in the province of Asia is forsaken me, Demas, he, he's off. And learning not to, and, but he's, at the end of it, he says, may the Lord not hold it against them. Mm. I was like, gosh, Paul experienced so much rejection from his followers. Mm. He's like, may the Lord not hold it against them. So those are the great lessons, failure of nerve, failure in heart, the importance of courage and leadership and the importance of compassion. Mm. Those are definitely the leadership challenges and dynamics I feel like not just I, I face but a lot of other people face. Mm. If I was going to say one other thing, mm. um, the other leadership lesson, getting back to that personal issue, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux talks about um, the importance of becoming a reservoir leader rather than a canal leader. Mm. And canals are those that distribute water, but the reservoir waits till it's filled and then it overflows. Mm. And getting back to what I said earlier, very, very important in terms of self-renewal and leadership to lead out of overflow. Mm. So sitting with God long enough so that there was stuff coming out of my life, not just distributing current things that I had. So those, I think, were the three big categories, courage, compassion, and that, that commitment to sort of self-renewal. Mm. Mm. Just, a, I guess, a follow-up question on that. John, it's it's interesting you mentioned uh, Failure of Nerve by Friedman and I sort of feel like it was a book that people read surface or perhaps heard the concept initially and we've had a, you know, I think leading up to the crisis, one of the big sort of things in the world was people experiencing personal anxiety. It was a huge pastoral issue. Yes. People felt personal anxiety. So when you talked about, oh, I found like when I was talking about um, a non-anxious presence, people interpreted that almost in this very personal therapeutic way oh yes, yes i want totally. to be that yes totally. um but when you dig into yes. freeman he's like literally like how do you maintain a non-anxious presence when you're facing incredible pushback and incredibly toxic people and a toxic environment yes um that also wedded with this moment where social media has meant that there's this tremendous instantaneous feedback loop. So leaders don't just hear about yeah. gossip through, oh, so-and-so saying this. It's like they're literally put. you put a picture up of, I don't know, walking your dog and you've got people attacking you about something. Um, what advice would you give? Yes. I guess we've got lots of young leaders listening to this and we know one of the real present things because we've received the emails is, how do you be that non-anxious presence in this form? Because this is not a personal thing as much as mm. it is 
a cultural thing. How, totally. how have you learned in this time when you've been getting flack on, on, on social media or different things? How, how do you actually do that? Um, so, so internally, I mean, the, the goal of godly differentiation Mm. You know, so like it's the ability to stand within a sense of call where you don't collapse back into the anxiety of your people for the sake of comfort. Uh, so internally, there's four things connected to it. Uh, for me, one is um, sort of the upward call. Who am I responsible to? I'm responsible primarily to Jesus. I'm an under-shepherd. Um, secondarily, secondarily um, faithfulness metrics, like, like uh, obedience and faithfulness to specifically what Jesus has asked me to do, not outcomes of our culture. Um, thirdly, um, the gaze of the soul, like in Hebrews 12, where it talks about uh, fixing our eyes on Jesus so you don't grow weary and lose heart. Mm. Mm. So it's like the internal gaze of the leader, remembering Christ's sufferings and rejection, that that will be a part of your leadership. And then the, the Japanese concept of the Kaizen non-defensive spirit, which is basically um, the goal of continuous improvement. In all criticism, is true. I can give you specific examples of when I was called out and it was unfair and it really helped. Mm. And, you know, so those are the internal sort of like attitudes I have. The second thing, particularly with the social media components, like is understanding who you're responsible to. I'm not mm. responsible to the whole world. Yes. To, you know, social media, I don't want to say it's not real life because it is such an integrated part of our lives. But it's not who I'm primarily responsible to. So I've got to find a way to acknowledge as a leader I have some public presence. Yeah. But then I have to have actual boundaries where I'm giving pastoral presence to the people who are part of my congregation. Mm. So I think it's important that we learn to engage where appropriate on particularly larger cultural issues. Mm. And then I think we have a responsibility to teach people how to interact with us. So mm. occasionally I would post things on social media like, Hey folks, I'm not doing the pastoral ministry in 140 characters or whatever on this. Yes. <laughs> or hey, I appreciate the DMs. I'll, I'll do what I can, mm. but folks, sometimes you need to see a counselor or a therapist. I, I can't do this. Yes, um, you know, on Instagram. I'm sorry. So teaching people um, how to act, and then I guess you're really defining the primary and secondary community that God's called you to respond mm. to. And I think if you're sort of consistent in your messaging, people understand those things. Mm. One insight I sort of got on this, though, which was a real insight. So I, I got some pretty visceral feedback that I'd under undercommunicated some concern on racial injustice in the United States. Mm. And I was like, oh, gosh, like that feels really unfair. I'm like one of the first pastors I know because I'm aware of like how important it is to show, show solidarity mm. uh, with people of color to, to respond to that mm. and to have a thoughtful response to it. And so I, I'm listening to this like pretty detailed critique of, of my leadership. And then I just had a revelation. I was like, you know, my, my fault here, if I look at our church's communication on this, we've under communicated by a, a factor of about 10. But if I look at my personal social media, I feel like I've communicated really, really well on this. And I said, this email that I got, a criticism email, not with a polite tone, helped me realize I'm assuming everybody in my church follows me on social media. Yeah, that that's yeah. the primary way they understand me. Mm. And I was like, no, there's a huge delta here. So having that non-defensive spirit actually helped me see, hey, I've got to do a better job communicating our church's heart towards this issue, not just my personal job as a leader. So, yeah. again, that integration between the pastoral and the personal, that was a big lesson I took away from this. Mm. Mm. I guess that leads into the next question, which is America is at this deep moment of polarization politically. And in many ways what I've noticed um, as someone who speaks into America a lot but doesn't live there is almost like theological battles have been replaced by by political battles <laughs> and um you know oh, totally. it's, it's almost like yeah it's it's almost irrelevant what your political your theological standpoint in some ways it feels like at this point in time um and it's interesting too like if you look at a lot of the political science indicators they're all flashing red for the u.s um at this point in time mm. what would your advice be for someone who all of a sudden you know was just like it, it felt like three years ago what people were looking for was you know a, a church which has got good biblical preaching that perhaps speaks into the culture with good worship, good connection, yeah. cool graphics, you know, in an urban centre that was almost like, oh, this will work, you know. But then they've just felt yeah. this tsunami wave um, of, you know, what do you think about all these issues? Um, how are you doing that and, and how would you communicate how to negotiate that, particularly that political side of it for um, young leaders listening? 
<laughs> well, I'd say, I mean, it's the importance of being rooted in our kingdom identity and making sure that our primary allegiance is, is in place and that it, from that posture and center, we work out the cultural dynamics. Mm. So it's, as my friend David Bailey says, your sociology can never interpret your theology. Your theology has to interpret your sociology. So you've got to get that right. So that means we are going to have a category-defying kingdom. It's not going to fit nicely into a new end. The same way that Jesus didn't fit into the Essenes, the Zealots, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. Yeah. We're not going to fit anywhere. So I think that means from that secure posture, there's going to be things in both parties and debates that we can affirm, and we have to show why they're biblical, mm. not just political. There's going to be things that we're called to critique. They are going to be biblically informed. And then there's going to be this huge role we play, which is called transcending cultural debates with kingdom leadership. Mm. Yeah. You know, so for, I mean, this probably gets into you know, maybe the next question or the, the natural follow along. But it's like, you know, America doesn't have a, a covenant. America's not Israel. Mm. America's just another country in the world. And so it's another kingdom of Babylon mm. with which followers of Jesus have to navigate life and leadership in the midst of. And so that gives us the prophetic stance of sitting back and be able to critique it without having sort of like a, vol a false view of almost like an imputed biblical American exceptionalism, mm. you know, so we able to just sort of step back and say, hey, this place isn't the kingdom of God. Stop trying to treat it like it is and make it mm. historically what it wasn't. So you get some objective distance. And I, I honestly think, you know, being from Australia gives me a little bit of an advantage in doing that. That yes. was going to be my next question. I yeah. felt like God bring me there so that I would have a little bit of prophetic distance perhaps yeah. to sort of speak into it in a moment like this. So Yeah. Were you going to follow up on that? Or that no, was no, your question? that was my question. Because, I mean, this, this is an interesting, yeah. uh, or maybe I'll, I'll, what yeah, I've noticed is in do. Australia, Australians will be super critical of everything. Like we're very good at being critical. But it's almost like a cultural fo uh, cultural taboo in Australia to be too passionate. Like like you can be against the Labor yes. Party, but if you're too pro the Liberal Party, you're bad. Or you, know, you can hate the Prime Minister, wow. but yeah. no one like pumps him up. So this is a weird thing where... Yeah. I think Australians have this insulation because we just are cynical about everything, and we're very cynical about politics. Yes. Yeah, I wonder yes. if that, that's possibly part of that resource. I guess too, like what, yes, what, you're, so. what you're getting at too is as well. Like, I mean, part of my sense is that what happened in the pandemic has been absolutely fascinating. Um, I did a lot of um, podcasts with different countries, and it was almost like these submerged yeah. issues in countries came up. Um, Northern Ireland is, okay. you know, currently um, seeing some violence on the streets. It's like the problems have emerged there. Um, you know, yeah. you see even even Australia, it's fascinating how Australia, I read this article, Australia's reacting like it did in the 1918 flu when we were just, you know, a bunch of colonies become one country. And it's been like that here. It's like um, people's state identities have all of a sudden come to the fore, which before Australians didn't even think about that. Um, so in a sense, what it's, I see it as this, um, the submerged worldviews have come into clarity. So in a sense, as you've been preaching and teaching, the, I think before the pandemic, we made a lot of assumptions. So what sort of worldviews have you seen rise to the surface under this moment of crisis? And how have you spoken into that? Um, I mean, that may not resonate. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, have, have you seen that concept of pre-existing worldviews emerging? Yes. I mean, I would say... Um Christian nationalism in the U.S. has emerged as a worldview. It's it's been basically it's been codified and clarified. Probably always present, but now that it's named, it's probably unmasked with a little more potency. Mm. And uh, that you know that's the idea that America, at its founding, has a special relationship with God. Mm. But but I would tell you this: like if you if you go to Philadelphia and you walk and look at all the founding documents, it'll shake you how much. God's stuff is in it. Mm. But living at a time of history that was informed by an explicitly Christian Judeo worldview means obviously that a lot of that stuff will be baked into it. So it's not necessarily coming out of devotional conviction. That was mm. for some of them. Yes. But a lot of people have taken what, what basically was a worldview of the time and then imputed motive to it, mm. which means like, no, their conscious desire was that has definitely risen up. And I've seen some scary, like a level of blindness and fervor in some private conversations around that that startled me. Mm. Um, the religion of science has sprung up, mm. you know, like in a crazy way where people like 
take whatever Christian says about faith, which is basically relational loyalty, people have put their relational loyalty, which is like my trust is in science. And it's shifting all the time, but that's okay. Wherever it shifts, that's my worldview. That has risen in ways. I mean, uh, I've said in other places, but I think it's so fascinating. This is the first crisis the US has faced without an explicitly religious framework to it. Hmm. So you think about 9-11 and everybody was like, how could God let this happen to America? There was no talk about God in our national conversation. And if it was, it was get Franklin Graham the heck out of New York City with his anti-LGBTQ, (laughs) anti-Islamic stances, and we don't even want his help. So the only time religion did show up, it was a part of the problem because it was against science. Mm. Um, The cult of secular justice, I think, you know, people – have imputed to uh, secular justice um, sort of like eternal and religious longings. Mm. And um, I think that's that's been sort of people, you know, as you know, as one as one author says, people want a kingdom without a king. Mm. <laughs> that's you, obviously. But no, you I think you've seen the emergence of mm. that sort of like secular salvation. And um, I, I've also seen, by the way, a radical commitment to Jesus being revealed. Mm. I mean, you, it's sprung up. It's like been an absolute radical commitment that Jesus is the way, truth, and the life, and mm-hmm. He's the only hope in the midst of this mess. So there's been, and that's what's made it actually so hard to lead. Mm-hmm. Um, the other challenging thing in the cultural conversation, you're always processing at different levels, and mm-hmm. they, you know, so as a preacher, I've alliterated them to start with P, but. You've got the principle, like what is the core idea people will be talking about? There's political, mm. there's policy, there's pastoral, and there's personal. And so in one conversation, somebody may jump from the political to the personal. Yeah. And in the same conversation, someone's talking from the past, pastoral or the policy perspective. Mm. And it's a giant web of disconnected perspectives, even mm. around the same issue. Mm. So all of that has been sort of um, swirling around, and it's been very, very hard to sort of hold your ground as a kingdom leader against mm. many ideologies that people have lived with religious fervor. You know? mm, yeah. Wow. It's interesting. I'd be fascinated to know your take on, again, coming from Australia, and my, my sense is that what has emerged in the US, and perhaps, again, it was submerged, but it's almost this kind new kind of post-Christianity um, which is very different to the rest of the West. Like the big thing we felt from here is how different America feels. Like a lot of the cultural moment commentary was like, oh, you know, we're in this progressive, secular, new Western world. But, I mean, for me, even before the um, pandemic, you know, I, I was in the US. Um, I think I spoke at um, uh, Church of the City. And then um, it's just interesting watching the US over a period where it was changing so rapidly um, and, yeah. you know, I, I then was in Europe and in the past, like 10 years ago, you go to like Scandinavia and Scandinavia would seem like, oh, this is the future. This is like some progressive city in the future. When I went to Scandinavia this time after the US, it felt like conservative. Um, like being in Denmark, it, was, it really? felt like almost conservative now, whereas the US was so much more fervent. And I think that I guess my, my sort of working theory here is that America has birthed a more religiously infused post-Christianity. Like in Australia, the post-Christianity everyone wants to get to sort of after the pandemic is let's just get back to having barbecues and go to the beach and it's where home. can we travel on a holiday? It's apathy. And, it's apathy. Yeah. A- apathy and, and swimming in privilege of – not privilege of like we need to insert ourselves culturally. It's more like the privilege that I deserve to have a good time and nobody hassle me. Um, yeah. But almost what's happening is the relig- – like it feels like re- America has one setting and it's just religious. So even the atheists who want to deconstruct faith seem like Pentecostal in their passion yeah, yeah. about it. Yeah, just interested in your t- take on that. No, I think that's true. Uh, America was founded with a revolutionary spirit. You know, mm. it was it was founded on fervor, and um, it's a strength and a weakness. You know, my, like my dad said to me when I moved to the US, I'll never forget. He said, "John, you just need to remember one thing: America has the best of humanity on and the worst of humanity on display at the same time with the same level of intensity." Wow! And that was in '97, yeah. and wow. it's still. I think that's very, very true. So, yeah, there's, there's something, there is something religious, d- devoted in the American spirit. And mm. it's honestly, it's why Aussie Pentecostals 
go to America and tend to do well. Yes. Like those who are not charismatic or Pentecostal come to the US, they may do well at a seminary or an academic setting, but the Aussie Pentecostal does well in American culture. Mm. Uh, because there's that there's that passionate resonance that that uh, fits in well there. Yeah, so it's definitely true. Americans love things and they hate things. And um, I, I actually love that about the US. I love it mm. when it's on track, and I hate it when it's off track because it's just mm. exhausting. Mm. It's exhausting. And a lot of Christian leaders, um, I think, you know, talking with my friends who are in ministry, they're disappointed that some people have shown more fervor for other causes than they've ever shown for the kingdom of God mm. in the last moment. Mm. So, you know, I think the key is sort of like converting that worldly passion to holy passion. Mm. I think that's a part of our discipleship so that we don't run after the same things as the pagans. Mm. We're running after the kingdom of God. Mm. That's good. I guess the last question, um, there is this moment where, yeah, it has hit this fervent moment We've also seen during the pandemic, um, you know, uh, it was really interesting. Like one of the things that I've written about is that crisis leads to renewal and um, also a crisis um, precedes renewal. One thing I realized is that crisis doesn't always lead to renewal, but crisis always yes. leads to a revealing. And so there's been a revealing in this time and often that's then setting up a foundation for an eventual renewal. But it's almost like, you know, how was the church going to react to this? And what we've seen is we've seen – leaders fall in in the last 12 months we've seen um christian you know celebrities for want of a better term deconstruct their faith publicly mm -hmm. um, and then there's just the tons of ordinary people who you know are in ministry who have walked away um or stepped out of ministry still got their faith maybe but just like i can't do this anymore this podcast is listened to by many young leaders <laughs> um and I think yeah. like, um, you know, as someone who has been doing this for a time um, and has walked through this season, I guess what would be like the one or two things you would say, um, you know, imagine this as you've got several thousand <laughs> young leaders before you um, in this moment, what would be your encouragement to them? Well, you know, to the, to the fall of celebrity leaders, I mean, it's like they're cautionary parables. You know, mm. Carl Lentz was a friend of mine, man. Mm. You know, that wasn't like a, just a celebrity. That was like a co-laborer. That was tragic, man. That made mm. me want to weep. I mean, I to this day have people on the streets of New York walking up to me in tears to say, you're the pastor from Church of the City. I go to Hillsong. What do I do? Oh. Like that That touched the, the kingdom ecosystem. So that wasn't just like a big scandal. That was like we felt that very deeply. Mm. We've got to, we've got to weep over those things. We've got to realize how high the stakes are. And mm. one thing I, I I feel like nobody sort of really talked about was they didn't talk about the spiritual warfare nature of this. Mm. You know, yeah. did Hillsong get a worldly culture? Yes, they did. I mean, that that was just you know, you sow to the flesh, you reap destruction. That's what it says in Galatians. Okay, could they have done better on that? Yeah, they should have. There should have been more accountability. But no one's talking about the giant target that people with that level of cultural influence have on their back spiritually. Satan wants nothing more than to take out leaders and discredit the gospel. So I would just, you know, watch your life and doctrine closely is Paul's exhortation of Timothy. So it's like, you know, hold fast to the faith and hold fast to your integrity and be aware that we're in a spiritual battle. You know, it's like things like fasting and seeking God and having prayer covering for your ministry and being aware of the, you know, the world, the flesh and the devil. We got to take this stuff seriously mm. um, because the thing that very few people talk about is that, that we see the large scandals, but they happen thousands of times every month in churches on yes. a small stage. Mm. Mm. And uh, what we need is a new generation with a profound loyalty to God and a profound fear of God. I, I always think um, I, I read in a book once, um, a pastor was visiting, I think it was Jimmy Baker when he was in prison. And he said to him, like, when did you stop loving Jesus, man? Mm. Like, how did this go wrong? And he said, I never stopped loving Jesus, man. I stopped fearing God. Wow. And I was like, you know, recovering <laughs> the fear of the Lord. It says in the book of Isaiah, the fear of the Lord is the key mm. to the treasure of wisdom that God has. So, yeah, fresh love and loyalty to Jesus, the fresh fear of God and awareness of the stakes. So humility, voluntary accountability, those sorts of things. I think, I think more of that. And I, I would also say this to young leaders. 
God's put you here now. Mm. You may feel overwhelmed. You may feel like, gosh, I'm not prepared for this. God and his sovereignty determine the time and place that you should live and lead. And he's put you here yeah. because he believes that you're the leader for the moment. Mm. So take that as a divine sense of affirmation and steward it well. Steward it well. God's got you here for this purpose. Mm. That's fantastic. So good. Super encouraging. I have uh, written a bunch of notes, which I'll reflect on later. Thank you so much uh, Mm. for all of your insights and your honest reflection on this past year um, and its many challenges, but also um, learnings that have come with it. John Tyson, you have a book coming out soon. What's the date that it's coming out? I think it comes out in May sometime, like early May. Great. May 9 or 11. Okay, yes. great. So keep an eye out for his new book, The Intentional Father, and this is all about discipling, uh, uh, fathers discipling their sons. Mm. Um, and I know I've seen stuff on Instagram of you and your son uh, doing the Camino Trail, which was uh, so yeah, exciting exactly. to, to watch along. So uh, looking forward to seeing that book come out. Thank you again so much for your time and we'll see you soon. I just wanted to say too, oh, just, just as we ended, Why you know, not? Just, just interrupting each other for, for a new, <laughs> new thing. But yeah, I just wanted to say too, John, like I think from us as this is an Australian podcast, just sort of to say, I know Aussies often don't celebrate uh, uh, their leaders and sons, but we just really wanted to say how I think like the church in Australia, how proud you know, we are of you and um, mm. how your influence, like in a sense, yes, you did leave Australia, but your influence here is is far and wide. Um, and just to see you, it's it's fantastic to see someone being transformed by God yeah. and ke- keeping, there's a still the, you've kept the Australian in you, which I think is actually a, a missional tool where you are, which is fantastic. Um, <laughs> and knowing what you've gone yeah. through in the last while, it's just been so in- encouraging. And I've been so encouraged to how you've championed my ministry. And um, yeah, so we, we're, we're really grateful for you and and thank you for all that you bring to the kingdom of God and and please keep going. Yeah. Oh, cheers, mate. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. So great. Thank you again, John. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Liddy. We'll see you next time.